welcome to what in my bleaker moments I think of as the great zone of powerlessness, uh, where we are stuck a few thousand miles away from this war zone. Um, but we can at least try to enhance our understanding of what's going on. My name is Giles Whittell. I'm an editor um, at Tortoise. Uh, and many moons ago, a correspondent in Moscow, not for as long as I would have liked, but for two years at the beginning of Putin's time in power. Uh, when we were first discussing what to discuss tonight, um, a suggestion that I had was that instead of the question, Putin, colon, how much opposition is there in Russia, we should simply quote from a former um, US ambassador to Moscow who will be known to some people on this call who posted a tweet in Russian, roughly, which roughly, roughly translates as uh, Russian people, are you not ashamed? Um, I think that probably was too punchy in a context where there are already enough punches being thrown. Um, but given where we are, given that NATO cannot and will not intervene militar militarily in this conflict, given that Putin has gone all in, especially over the last 24, 36 hours. The, the critical questions, uh, it seems to me, besides how and how long the Ukrainian people will resist the army advancing on them from so many directions, is how and how long the Russian people will support him. Um, and I hope over the course of the next hour, and of course the obverse of that question is, is how much opposition is there in Russia? And I hope we can consider his inner circle. Um, thank you, Phoebe, who's in the chat, uh, for that uh, extraordinary picture of the Security Council meeting last week. Um, the oligarchy, more generally, civil society, the street, uh, the formal opposition, insofar as it exists in, in Russia. And um, I would like, if if people want to, to get to uh, the command and control uh, apparatus within the military on which the execution of military orders depends. I accept that that's perhaps a somewhat discreet subject for another night, but if people want to get into that, uh, we can. We are joined by Professor Sam Green from King's College London, Director of King's Russia, um, and uh, a long-term resident of the real Russia uh, in what may feel like a, a previous life by uh, Melinda Herring, I hope, who can join us um, in due course if she's not managed to dial in already from the Atlantic Council, and Sir Roderick Lyne, former ambassador, UK ambassador to Moscow for some fairly critical years in this story, if uh, assuming we're taking a long view, which we should. Before we get stuck in, the usual plea um, for those, um, well, it will sound uh, usual, uh, for those who've been to Thinkins before, but for those who haven't, this is really an exercise in hearing from everybody. So we do have a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience uh, uh, in our guest speakers, from our guest speakers, which I hope we'll be tapping into, but please, uh, the hour flies by, dive in with your thoughts in the chat or by raising um, your electronic hand. Electronic is, is probably better than real, I'm more likely to see you. And we will um, uh, bring in as many of you as possible. I hope that we're joined by some people from uh, Moscow uh, and, and other countries, uh, possibly Ukraine as well. We'll do please let us know, um, we'll let Phoebe know in the chat if you'd like to say something, uh, but of course you can express yourself in the chat as well. Uh, this is all about knowing more about a complex, fast-moving story um, whose outcome will depend obviously on what's happening in Ukraine, obviously to an extent on what's happening in the West, but critically on what happens over the next few days, weeks and months in, in Moscow. Um, I'd like to come first then to uh, you, Sam Green, um, and I warned you in advance that I'd start by quoting from your book, uh, whose title I should be able to uh, quote to you very accurately, the people versus Putin or Putin and uh, forgive me, I should have way around you. Putin versus the people, Putin versus the people, uh, right at the top of the text, 
Vladimir Putin is a popular man. He is also a dictator. That is not a contradiction. And a little further in, Vladimir Putin's rule is not forced on an oppressed and unwilling public, but is co-constructed through a process of political struggle involving Putin, his opponents, and tens of millions of supporters. There are two questions I want to put to you um, right at the top. One is very simple. Do you personally think that this will be his undoing? You could come to that later if you like. But maybe, perhaps first of all, that mention very high up in your book of his opponent's role in the sort of construction of his power. How does that work? And, and how many are there? Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation um, and, uh, and for plugging the book and, and, and for, um, you know, for, 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 for really is, is a difficult question. It's a difficult question in part because frankly, you know, um, it's, the book came out in 2019. I think it's still relevant. I like to think it's still relevant, right? Um, but in a lot of ways, I feel like we're living in a very different world in a very different Russia. So things have changed uh, since then. Um, uh, the original title that the president's infinite wisdom decided not to go with, and, and in fact, was Russia at War, which now feels like it would be selling like hotcakes. But um, but the, um, uh, the 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 argument and the reason for that title, right, was was really that that you know Russia is, despite you know what we're thinking of of, of Russia as as an authoritarian state right, ruled by um, a, a man who has amassed a tremendous amount of power over the administrative state, over the federal state, over the judiciary, over the banks, the the financial system, the security apparatus, uh, and really the media, the political parties, anything you can you can imagine. Um, it's still not uh, a command and control kind of system where he can sort of coerce uh, coerce compliance, right? Um, and what we've seen over his time uh, in in office is that um, uh, as he has concentrated power, we can talk, I suppose, later about you know why he felt it was necessary to concentrate control over all of these things that the Russian presidency did not control when he inherited it from from Yeltsin in in '99 and 2000. Um, he uh, began to, to, to grow in opposition right? because of the, th the, 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 the ways in which he was beginning to sort of monopolize the kinds of futures that ordinary Russians could, could, could build for themselves. Right? So 2011, 2012, we have the first major um, uh, opposition protest, not enough really to threaten his power, right? but uh, throwing up uh, more of a challenge than he had ever faced uh, before. And it was really amongst people who, as, as Putin was returning to the presidency, having been prime minister for four years, who felt that uh, the, the vision of the future um, uh, that, that they had was not compatible with, with Putin coming back to, to power, and they mobilized um, in, in defense of that future. Of course, Putin, again, sitting atop all this machinery, was able to, to win that fight, right? But he won it in ways that have fundamentally changed the nature of Russian politics. He had to introduce ideology into Russian politics in ways that were, uh, that, that were not true before. Right. Putin before that had really tried to be sort of all things to, to all people. If you wanted to see a conservative, nostalgic Russia, you could you could find reasons to support Putin. If you wanted to see a modernizing, uh, a Europeanizing Russia, you could find reasons to support Putin. Um, the uh, the opposition really pushed him into an agenda based around uh, family values, or as, as he would put it, or, or or traditional conservative values, as others would put it. Um, you think about the uh, agenda around um, uh, uh, defending the, the Russian Orthodox Church, um, uh, the agenda around anti-LGBT campaigns and things like that, uh, anti-migrant campaigns in, in, in a lot of cases as well, but also around confrontation with the West, right? This consolidating sense that, uh, that, that opposition essentially is, um, is fomented uh, by forces that are not loyal to Russia, um, but fomented by governments and foundations that originate from outside of Russia, uh, to the point where we get to 2021, and uh, and uh, the the state is is both beholden to an ideology, right, that is um, uh, uh, insular and, um, and 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 confrontational, right, um, and has tarred essentially all opposition internally as as treasonous. Right. Um, so when Russia had its last right. parliamentary elections in, in September of 2021, uh, it was essentially impossible to contest those elections. It was impossible to um, to cover those elections, to monitor those elections, uh, unless um, you were uh, approved uh, by the 
by the presidential administration and the, the, the fact or the perceived fact of, 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 of global confrontation with a, a West and particularly a United States is hell bent on, on the destruction of, of Russia or at least the limitation of Russian sovereignty mm -hmm. right, was the, 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 the justifying uh, animus right, for, um, uh, uh, for all of that. Right? Um, the um, as he's as the states harden and coming to, you know, to, to to the answer to, to your question about how much of an opposition is there, uh, as the state hardens, the opposition hardens. Right? It's uh, it's uh, it's it, it's a two way again a process of co construction. They really mm -hmm. do give form to um, uh, to each other. Right? But we've seen given the. The, just the growing level of repression, the rapidity with which uh, the Russian state takes protesters off the streets, the rapidity with which the, the Russian state increasingly is is uh, clamping down on people who try to mobilize online and in 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 ways that are much more resemblant now of, of the way China has done that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, has um, uh, forced a lot of people, uh, some people into jail, a lot of people into, into exile, uh, and even more people into uh, reticence, right? So the protests right. that we've seen over the last four days against the war right, are smaller, for example, than the protests um, uh, that we saw in the beginning of 2021 when Navalny came back from, from Germany and was arrested. Um, but uh, they have still yielded something in the range of about 6,500 arrests uh, just over the last right. five days or so. Um, so um, uh, there is an opposition, right? Um, but it is um, uh, it is it is cowed, right? Um, and it is looking around to understand uh, sort of where the the the, the next wave of, of support for it might might come from. That's so interesting. Um, you would have thought that, given the ideological component of Putinism post twenty twelve, post mm -hmm. those big demonstrations uh, against his return, that, that that would have been both highly polarizing and galvanizing um, for an opposition movement in a sense. Is, is the fact that there have not been more people on the streets since this misbegotten war began really simply a function of all too human fear? Um, you know, it's very hard for me to know, right? I'm sitting here currently, you know, um, actually on, on supposedly on sabbatical in the United States. Um, uh, and, and so the only thing I know about what's going on in, in Moscow is, is really conversations I'm able to have with friends and a little bit I'm able, able to go, get off of, of social media uh, and the, uh, the very enterprising independent media outlets that, that are left. Fear is, is part of it. Um, I think lack of prospect is another part of it, right? I think if you look around Russia, it's actually pretty hard to find people who think that the country is terribly well governed. Uh, and that's true, whether we're talking about the elite and some of the people you, you mentioned at the outset, or whether we're talking about ordinary citizens. Um, the, the, the problem is finding people who believe that a change in government would actually bring uh, any kind of, of, of benefit, right? Um, and there's precious little in the last 40 years of, of Russian experience, right? That would suggest that a change in government could bring any, any substantial material benefit to um, uh, to people's lives, right? So it's always, if you're looking at mobilization, it's a risk reward calculation, right? Um, how much risk am I, am, am I willing to take? Uh, and what is the, the, the likely outcome of it? There's other things that, that feature into it, emotion features into it, so sort of social support and context feature, uh, uh, feature in, in, in that calculation. But, but that sense of what can be achieved um, is, um, is important. I would say though that that shifts, and this is where the war comes in, um, you know, you asked this question about whether um, uh, whether you know, this is is the beginning of the end, or, or so I don't remember exactly how you phrased it. The, the uh, I mean, I would think that um, if there is um, going to be a moment, right, um, uh, at which something really fundamental breaks for Putin, right, it's going to be a moment very much like this, because what this does is it it pulls the rug out from under again the ability of of 140 million Russians, right, to imagine their future, right? Um, the bottom begins to fall out of the economy, right? The ways in which they've been grown used to, to, to consuming, to traveling the world, to having the world accessible to them, right, um, uh, is, uh, is no longer available. And it's not going to be a matter of months before it becomes available again. It could be a matter of, of a decade, right, uh, depending on, mm -hmm. uh, on how things go, right? So if anything is going to provoke um, some kind of a response, right, we would 
expect it to be something like this, which is very far from being a prediction that this is going to, to cause that. Right? Um, right. But it is something that, that Putin should be worried about. And I think that, that it's something that if we look at, at the conduct of the war and how the how state television is talking about the war, it is something that, that, that he is worried about. Thank you, Sam, very much. Um, I have received that um, uh, message, welcome message that Melinda Herring has joined us. Mel Melinda, I, uh, thank you very much. I want to throw you straight in there if you, if you don't mind. Hi. Um, uh, just picking up from what Sam was saying there about the odds of this war uh, being ultimately Putin's undoing. Um, you are deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, and crucially, you formerly edited the Atlantic Council's Ukraine Alert blog, which today is carrying very prominently two pieces saying quite, it's two pieces by Ukrainians saying unequivocally, Putin, this is his catastrophic error. So my, my question, given that our exam question this hour is, is about the sort of extent and nature of of your position in Russia. Is this also an, is this an error that reveals a hitherto, as Sam put it, cowed opposition um, within Russia? Or, or do you believe that in fact, it isn't there? So thanks for the chance to be here. And I'm so sorry I'm late. I screwed up the time change. Not at all. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. So I think this is something, uh, can I answer it? Can I give you a different answer? Is that okay? If I don't yeah. give you a B, can I give you C? You can answer a okay. totally different Great. question if you want. Okay, so I'm gonna say C. This shows the hubris of Vladimir Putin. This shows that he thinks he understands uh, Ukraine and he clearly does not. That That's that's my answer. So he's made a number of mistakes here. Um, and he they, they were they were built on the premise that, that uh, Ukraine has not changed that much since 2014. So uh, th I think I think that's how I would answer the question. I'm encouraged, though, to see the number more than 50 protests across Russia. I mean, these are not going to change. You know, these are not going to bring down the regime. We know we know that. Um, mm. and, and Russia today is not what it was in 2014. There is fewer opportunities to protest. The opposition is abroad and independent media is, is uh, abroad as well. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that Vladimir Putin is leaving today or anytime soon. But I, I do think that, that uh, Vladimir Putin has made an enormous tactical error uh, and that the end is quite near uh, if the pressure continues as is. But you make the point that the protests, such as they have been so far on the streets in, in Russia since the 24th, have, are not going to bring him down. Um, uh, so. I, I come. I come back to the question: it, it, is, Isn't there a big gap between the reality on the ground and and what you're forecasting? And I, I worry also that here in the West, uh, not absorbing the the news diet that most Russians are absorbing, which consists broadly of, of state-controlled TV, that we have a fundamentally different and fundamentally optimistic, over-optimistic view. Of, of how uh, ordinary Russians will react uh, medium term. But point taken. I think that's a very fair point. Uh, I think I'm one of the victims on this call who, who watches Russian state TV from time to time. And you're right, it's a different reality. It absolutely is. I, I think the hope though, is that more and more Russians will see the images uh, coming out of Ukraine. And I fully expect those images to get worse and worse as there's more civilian bombings. We know, uh, I mean, we, we don't have good polling data right now. Sam might have better data than I've seen. The last data I saw was before last uh, Thursday and 60% of Russians said they supported the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and they support independence for the People's Republics. So that was before uh, you know everything started on Thursday. I think it's probably 50-50. Uh, and as more horrifying images and violence against ordinary citizens comes out, I think those numbers are going to change. But I, I think it's really incumbent on the West. You're right. We, we should not pretend uh, and, and delude ourselves into thinking that, that Russia is right for the picking. I'm not making that argument at all. I think this is going to be a really, really hard fight. I'm encouraged, though, to see uh, you know that, that there's oligarchs who are are starting to pull off, uh, and and that there's business major companies like Shell um, have have terminated their agreements in Russia. Uh, I think it's a matter of time. Is the argument that I'd like to make? Okay, and just a quick technical question: uh, 
how does the Russian public get sight of those images, get uh, um, exposure to the kind of information that we are mainlining at the moment? Um, I mean, it, it, I guess it's a fact, is it not, that there isn't an internet firewall barring access for them to that kind of information such as exists in China? Yeah, so they still have access to YouTube, and that's sort of iffy. There's there's a lot of uh, concern right now in, in Moscow, uh, in liberal circles, uh, that, that YouTube is going to be restricted, but so far, so good. Uh, and I, I interviewed Vladimir Milov a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I said, what's, what's the story? Uh, the opposition movement is hanging on a thread. They rely on YouTube to get their political videos out. And he said, cat videos are going to save us. And I said, excuse me, cat videos? And he said, yes, cat videos. He said, there's millions of ordinary Russians who want to watch cat videos or they want to watch a video about how to unlock their apartment door. So you, you can't just completely turn off YouTube. That was his thought. But other, other liberals now are worried that the, the state may turn off YouTube. Uh, they have access uh, to Twitter. There, there's accounts that I've read, though, that, that Twitter is being throttled and, and that they can't see images. I think it's time for the West to stand up, though. Uh, I, 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 there, there's some ideas here in Washington, and I'd love to know what you all are talking about, about uh, standing up a, a uh, Russian language television station uh, and Western governments you know, declassifying these images and, and showing them to the Russian people. I think there's a huge role for that now and a need for it. Thanks so much. We'll, we'll uh, poll people to see what they think about that. Um, there's a lot of uh, action in the chat and I will want to come to some of those remarks. I see uh, people are in inevitably asking uh, about the nuclear option to which Putin seemed to have reached. Um, but first, let me come to Sir Roderick Lyne, uh, amb UK ambassador to uh, Moscow in another era uh, that began in 2000 when Putin was already uh, prime minister, I think uh, about to become president and lasted for his, his first four years. Uh, and then you were subsequently um, uh, at, at Chatham House, where I'm going to quote from a blog post that went up uh, today. Sadly, uh, Joanna Shostek wrote, uh, most Russian citizens will not care enough to look beyond the state controlled news sources, which continue to deny any invasion of Ukraine is even taking place. Um, you've been watching Russian society, Roderick, for a long time. Uh, do you buy that view, which is essentially that um, the Ruski Narod, um, the Russian people, are supine? Uh, no, I think you've got to segment it. But let me say, uh, and this is relevant, you quoted a tweet by a former American ambassador uh, at the beginning. Um, if I was tweeting to Russia, I would say, are they telling you the truth? And the point of that is that those who are alive for the Soviet period, which alive and adult, roughly half more than slightly more than half the Russian population knew that they were being lied to by their leaders. Um, yes, a lot of people in Russia have the television on all the time. For a lot of ordinary people in Russia, this is their main news feed, and they are being affected by it. That is absolutely clear. I've I've seen many messages coming out of Russia that show that there is a segment of the population, particularly the elder segment, particularly perhaps the less sophisticated, the less inclined to access different channels of information, that has believed, understandably, this bombardment of propaganda, that this is a war against NATO uh, and a war against uh, Ukrainian Nazis. And it is, of course, essential for the regime to present this as a war against NATO, uh, a war to kill Ukrainians is a lot less popular in Russia. Um, there's quite a lot of polling evidence indeed to show that while there's majority support for action against NATO, there's only minority support uh, actually for action against Ukraine. Um, then I think you've got to think about the younger population. There was a really interesting Levada poll a couple of years ago that showed that uh, over 40% of the Russians in a poll of I think 10,000 uh, between the ages of <clears throat> 16 and 24 said that if they could, they'd like to live abroad. And the younger generation <clears throat> there, as anywhere else, are much less inclined to take their news uh, straight off the television. So then you've got the elite. And it's 
clear, I think, from just about everything we're hearing out of Moscow, that the political class, the business class, what you might call the Moscow elite, thought that Putin was bluffing, even when, well after indeed, Western intelligence had publicly, uh, very clearly stated its opinion that he was going to go ahead with an invasion, had published invasion plans. Uh, you had this body of sophisticated opinion in Moscow that simply thought he couldn't do it because it would be such a dumb, such a damaging thing to do. Uh, there is indeed evidence that some very, very senior members of his own administration, possibly his own chief of staff, uh, supposedly his own prime minister and foreign minister and others, people who are going to have to deal with the consequences of this, uh, did not know until he did it that he was going to do it. Um, and uh, there have been some very, very strong expressions of opinion by this influential, not massively numerous group of people, but very influential group of people. I would draw attention, for example, to a remarkable letter of protest signed now by over 600 Russian scientists. I, I don't understand why it hasn't had any play in the West because it came out uh, on, I think, the 25th of February. And when I Googled to look for it today, I had a copy from Russia. I could only find it on Chemistry World. Uh, if I had the reference in front of me, I'd give it to you. It begins with TRV. Um, but these are members of the Academy of Sciences, which is a very, uh, many of them, uh, either academicians or corresponding members or professors of the Academy of Sciences. The Academy of Sciences is a massively important organization in Russia. Uh, its president has cabinet status. So you have that. You have uh, protest uh, messages coming out of the Moscow uh, State Institute of International Relations, UMGIMO, which is the finishing school for the elite where people like Lavrov went. Um, so I think you've got a bureaucracy that is deeply unhappy. It's not going to rebel because its own jobs are at stake. Uh, and then I think you do have different strata in the population. But we also have to remember that there are people, and I've heard reports of the people finding this in the workplace, who are rallying around the flag. And that tends to happen mm -hmm. when a war starts. Uh, and if you're opposed to it, uh, you may find that you have to keep fairly quiet in your office. I think that effect will diminish. Um, it'll diminish once more and more information starts to come out from Ukraine through telephone calls from Ukrainians to Russians to relatives or friends in Russia, through social media, uh, through soldiers coming back or passing stories back about what they found and who they thought they were fighting uh, and they weren't fighting NATO. Um, and indeed, as the effects of sanctions start to uh, bite into people's lives, which they are already doing with queues outside ATMs. So I think there will right. be a shift. Thank you so much. I want in a second to come to Oli Kokris, um, who has joined us from Moscow. But but first, Roderick, before I let you um, uh, have a sip of water, two quick questions. Uh, first, I, I love your take on that highly theatrical Security Council meeting and whether you think that possibly in the past week, any of those uh, functionaries, they're more than functionaries, they're powerful people in Putin's inner circle, including his defense minister, uh, maybe, maybe having a rethink. Uh, but, but also you mentioned businesses and we've seen interviews on the streets in the past 48 hours of business owners, middle-class business owners who, have, who are seeing their livelihoods and those of their employees tanking as a result of, of sanctions. Um, are they another group uh, that could not that could actually mobilize in some way, as well as expressing their dismay to a foreign reporter on the street? Well, I'm sure that there are a lot of people in senior positions in the bureaucracy, in the government, uh, and I would speculate, indeed, even in the general staff of the Russian army, who think that this is utterly misconceived. Uh, and, and I should think the overwhelming majority of the business community would think that way. But then the critical question is whether we're talking about Russian people on the streets uh, or we are talking about senior people around the elite, is how on earth can they actually change their leader? 
there is no mechanism for doing this. It was easier in Soviet times. Khrushchev was thrown mm -hmm. out in 1964 because he was answerable to the Central Committee and the Politburo. Putin is answerable to nobody, and he has made absolutely sure, particularly since the Maidan of 2005, that he has got levers to pull to repress any threats to himself uh, through the FSB, through the National Guard, which is directly under his control, uh, and indeed through the alliance that he has forged with the military leadership. So he will refuse to go. He absolutely will never retire uh, because he cannot afford to. But the question of how he could be forced out by a lot of people who think that he has gone stir crazy to do what he's done is a very, very hard one to answer. Thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, I'd like to come to Oli if we can, and perhaps after that, even though he hasn't got his hand up, Quentin Peel, who I think is in the room. Um, Oli, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I noticed that you've, uh, I hope we can hear you um, unmute if you hadn't, you hadn't have already. Have you, have yeah, good. Uh, you, you're, you're saying in the chat, basically, that young people are uh, looking at a bleak, uh, bleak prospect and heading for the Caucasus rather than the barricades. I paraphrase a little bit. Um, mm. Why is that? Well, I think to take um, to take uh, Mr. Mr. Lyon's point, um, it's a delineation, and I have to make the caveat as to the people I've been speaking to about this. Um, that's an important aspect of this. Um, my level of Russian isn't sufficient to be able to speak to uh, Russian people who can who can't converse a reasonable level in English, and so they obviously have to take into account the socioeconomic backgrounds of the people that I've come into contact with. Um, but it's been very, very like truly heartbreaking to hear about how over the, the last pretty much a week the narrative has completely changed to. Um, seeing no future in Russia, they, the industries they work in have been crippled by the sanctions and they're looking basically to get out as soon as possible because they realise the situation isn't going to get any better, certainly in the short term. And so they're looking for ways to, to get out while it's somewhat, somewhat possible. Uh, and from what you're saying, there's almost no talk of trying to force the agenda, force change in the old fashioned way of, of taking to the streets. And I don't mean that glibly, uh, I, no. because it, it happened uh, in 1990, um, uh, but perhaps not in their memory. Um, I'm, I, do, do they talk about, uh, about recent Russian history at all and, and, and the, the, the sort of people power's role in the decline of the Soviet Union, or is that not part of your conversations? It's something that I try and respectfully uh, bring up in conversation. I think um, given, the, uh, given the difficulty and a lot of these people also have either relatives or um, close family, you know, other family members who are either in Ukraine or in the south, um, southwest of Russia. Um, it try and, I try and approach it with a respectful, in a respectful manner. But um, what, um, what a lot of people talk about is that the personal risk that they find. Um, so if they, they want to protest, they want their voice to be heard, they want to, you know, be on the street to, to show how much that how much how much disdain they have for this decision that their government has taken that they don't support, but it is at a huge personal cost for them. So I think it's it's a continuation of the points made by um, Sam and Roderick. I think that um, the, you know, the continuation of the Putin's control over the aspects of um, media dissemination and the cost that people incur in their lives is, has become so great that it's quelling any sort of, and you know, the feeling inside people can't express because of the personal, from, from what I've experienced anyway, I can't speak for everyone of course, but um, from what I've experienced, right. that would be my takeaway from it. Do you, do you know any people who have protested and or been arrested uh, since the 24th? Not personally. I have a, a friend of a friend who was arrested and um, kicked off their university course for, for being at the protest. Uh, and why do you say, uh, for obvious reasons uh, in the chat, that some of those you know, uh, uh, when they talk about getting out, go to the court, uh, get, talking about... I, I didn't want to talk too much, but um, basically, just, just with the, um, the Soviet history, you know, many people in the Caucasus, especially in Armenia, um, very much like Russian speaking, culturally quite similar. Um, you know, people, and it's also very popular, like a friend of mine was telling me today, it's a very popular tourist destination for 
certainly uh, Moscovites, but Russians in general. So the prospect of going somewhere where um, things that are increasingly more difficult here in Moscow, are, they're able to do. Um, language isn't so much of an issue. They may be already familiar with the city. Um, it makes it a it makes it an easy choice. Thank yeah, you so much. Sorry, that's um, quite yeah. That's a bit of a contrary way to put it, but it, it makes it an, an easier choice given that they can't they can't come to the, can't come to Europe. Understood. Understood. Thank you. And and I I kind of uh, digging the the um, the lighting. Uh, there is absolutely no way anyone's going to recognize you on the street from your uh, uh, backlighting. Um, can we come to Quentin Peel uh, if, if he's still on the call? Um, hello. Um, now, I know that you've been following uh, international affairs and Russian in particular for a very long time. Um, is there uh, an opposition uh, Bearing in mind uh, Roderick's um, warning that we need to we need to think of Russian society not as a monolith but as segmented, uh, that might be, first of all, informed by the current crisis and then galvanized by it, or is that Western wishful thinking? It's incredibly difficult to tell. I think I, I've really not managed to be in touch with very many Russian friends. Uh, in fact, the two most recent ones, I discovered one has left the country for Georgia and the other is in Latvia. Um, and I fear that that is where the more liberal Russians may be looking for an out. But like Roderick, I'm absolutely convinced that this will be and is a very unpopular war to an awful lot of Russians. And for them to see the sort of... Um, if they do see or hear through other channels than the state television, uh, the assault on Kharkiv, which is after all, overwhelmingly a Russian speaking town, um, I think that would be incredibly shocking to them and, and uh, just a totally different circumstance to the takeover in 2014 of Crimea. So I, I'm still convinced that this will prove to have been a massive miscalculation by Putin, mm. but I don't actually have evidence yet because those are really quite small numbers of protesters, however brave they may be in Russia. What I do think is that it's incredibly important that we keep lines open as much as possible to all forms of Russian opinion. And I'm rather worried at the campaign to close down uh, Russia Today or Sputnik in the uh, rest of Europe, because I think the backlash will be that our own correspondents and journalists will probably get kicked out of Russia, and we'll get less and less of the other side of the story. Uh, and because just like in all wars, we are getting it all incredibly in black and white. And there's so many Russians uh, I've had one message which just said I'm ashamed to be Russian, um, and uh, they they will be appalled. They say Russia is not Putin. Right. Allow yourself um, a little bit of of speculation. Um, I know it's dangerous, but in a sense, we are, we're all feeling our way through uh, an information war. Um, if if as you say the uh, attack on Kharkiv is particularly shocking because it's essentially a Russian city. Um, at, at what, and, and if that does lead to a, a, a broad recalibration of the way a lot of Russians think about this, um, what, is, is there a key factor that, uh, that you would be looking at um, as, a, as an indicator that the change was happening. I mean, when I was there, not for very long and a long time ago, it, um, the, the, the bravest people apart from some of the fighters in Chechnya were the soldiers' mothers, the Committee of Soldiers' Mothers. And, and we, we would look out for where they were protesting and, and how they were being, um, uh, uh, how their protests were being absorbed by, by authority. I mean, do, do you anticipate that... Um, the, this is 
going to be a case uh, if, if the conduct of the war uh, brings a sea change in Russian opinion, that it will be uh, as a result of social media just flooding back and going viral, or will it, will it be a narrower channel um, to particular people who then get the message out much more slowly? I, I, I'm not sure that I can answer your question really, Giles, because I, I haven't been in Russia for what, five mm -hmm. six years now, and I just don't really have a good feeling for how much um, real conversation there is out there. I'm sure there is uh, on the internet in various ways, um, but what worries me is that I'm not seeing that. I'm probably not internet savvy enough for it. Um, but certainly the mothers of, uh, of soldiers who, and the body bags coming back will be, uh, I think, a very shocking thing to the system. And then the only question is, who is going to be the person who actually, you know, confronts Putin and gets rid of him? Because again, as Roderick said, there's no system for getting rid of him any longer. So it's a society where I suspect um, dissent will be kept really under a tight lid until it blows. And that may come very suddenly. It, it's such an important and interesting point that about there being no mechanism uh, to remove him, even if anyone uh, had the courage. I, I, I'd like in, in a minute, if, if he's willing to uh, talk, to come to Philip Luff, uh, you mentioned in the uh, chat that you worked in Moscow, um, and, and I'd be interested to ask you a bit about how you think businesses and business people will be, be reacting. But first, I'd like to come back to Sam Green uh, with a, a, a more specific question about a particular part of the opposition that we all know about, namely no Alexei Navalny and, and, and his supporters. Navalny is in prison, possibly for as, much, as many as 10 years now, um, having been sort of resentenced while the world was looking the other way. Uh, most of his supporters um, uh, have either been muzzled or have, have left. There was there was a time when the the ballpark figure for the proportion of Russians who paid attention to Navalny and absorbed his message was about five percent. Um, but you notice that the number of people who viewed his extraordinary hour long documentary about Putin's palace on the Black Sea was way more than five percent. So what? you what traction you think he has phoebe put on one of the slides uh some remarks that he's managed to get out from from prison could he be a rallying point um he could be but i think at the moment actually what's happening is 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 beyond him right so what i'm hearing from people who've been out in the streets protesting um and from some journalists who've been able to cover them is that um, uh, some of so there are various as as Roderick and others have said right there are various parts to to uh, to Russian society and various parts even to the Russian opposition and um, you know, not all of, of whom identify with with Navalny he's clearly the the, the biggest leader he has the the the, the, the uh, largest number of of, of potential uh, voters uh, and and the strongest organization, or at least he did until it was declared extremist and essentially decimated. Um, but um, there were those who you know, didn't come out uh, to to protest in in his support in 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 2021 because he he wasn't their man. Um, uh, those people are on the streets, right, uh, protesting now, because even though they don't like him, right, this isn't about him, this is about, this is about the war, this is about the loss of the, of, uh, of their sense of the future of their, of, of their country, and about um, uh, something being done in their name, right, that they don't, um, that they don't believe is, is moral or, or justified. Um, so, uh, you know, there is a, uh, a sense that he is, um, you know he, he's important. Certainly, what he's done in coming back and and allowing himself to be arrested, right, um, is uh, you know broadly seen as as very brave uh, and 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 very moral um, and um, and actually quite extraordinary um, by even those people who who, who are not inclined to to, to support him. Um, you're right that that what he and his colleagues have been able to produce um, you know does have a resonance that, that goes well beyond the number of people who would probably likely to to um, 
to vote for him. Um, but um, uh, what we're seeing actually now at the moment, I think, is, is, is a growing coalition, uh, both of formal and, and, and informal opposition groups within Russia and in the diaspora, um, who are beginning to understand that now is not the time to fight about who the next leader of Russia is going to be. Right now is the, the, the time to fight about let's get to a next leader of Russia and then decide right, um, um, who it's going to be. It's, it, it's almost uh, kind of a, a national salvation movement, given mm -hmm. Uh, the stakes that, that that Putin has has really um, raised for the country. Thank you, Philip Luff. Can we come to you? Um, as some, hi. Um, you you worked in London in twenty in Moscow, excuse me, in twenty fourteen and fifteen. And um, as Sam was just saying there, um, the people on the streets are not necessarily or or even at all Navalny supporters. They're there for diff different reasons. Um, including uh, some of them, as we mentioned earlier, dismayed at the cratering of the economy, which is happening extraordinarily quickly. Um, and you mentioned in the chat that um, when, when you were there, all foreign media had to sell 80% of their businesses to Russian entities. A similar sort of act of um, economic dictatorship has taken place today in which foreign investors have been told they cannot um, dump Russian assets for the, for the time being. From what you know of, 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 of Russian business or saw of Russian business, uh, how, how, how serious is, uh, are, are, are the, how seriously are the sanctions going to bite? And, 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 and do you imagine that um, the dismay that we've seen on the part of Russians who were invested in, in their economy is going to uh, translate into political action of any kind? I, yes, from from what I've seen, you know, there is there's a there's a huge divide in terms of um, information and education, um, and you know the team that I was managing, we had about fifty staff working for us in Moscow, and we also had an office in Kiev, um, about twenty staff there at the time. Uh, I mean, most of the people who worked for uh, you know our business were well educated, well informed, well travelled. Uh, and had a very different view of uh, what was going on to, to their parents, to their cousins, to the other family. So there was a, a massive divide in, in level of knowledge and understanding. Uh, most of my, my friends and colleagues were on, online getting all of their news from the BBC or CNN. Um, but you know, because of the, the background to the sanctions back in you know, 2014, 2015, the Crimea, um, you know, the government has tightened control over all media um, to the extent where, you know, CNN is highly regulated. Um, uh, yeah, but it's interesting to see media companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony are now stopping distribution of their, of their feature films and TV series into Russia. Uh, I mean, another massive shift, not only um, in terms of you know, voicing their opinion of what's going on, but I do fear that you know the the, the loss of of foreign or, or Western culture coming into Russia yet yet even more. So that really has right. impact as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, I might in in a minute ask if we can just come to Yasmin Abdel Magid. Uh, you you mentioned consternation and fear um, on the part of Russians in the UK, which is an interesting point because of course uh, the long arm, arm of the Kremlin famously reaches this far. But first, if, if we can, I'd like to come back to Melinda. Um, uh, Philip there was making the point that um, the state control of the media has tightened enormously since he was there uh, at the time of the, of the annexation of, of Crimea. Um, as a former, editor of the Ukraine Alert blog. I'm really interested in your take on a particular particular episode in this in this drama, which is was Zelensky's speech in Russian, which is his mother tongue, uh, to the Russian people uh, just a few hours before the invasion, pleading for peace. Um, how many people do you think will have heard that? I mean, it was enormously emotive and persuasive, but but if it if it just didn't go over literally, 
um, will it just sink without trace, or, or do you think will it? Is there some way that it will live and and gain traction later? I, I think that's a, a fantastic question, and I had the same response uh, when I heard the speech. I, I had chills coming up my back. I thought it was really, really powerful. Um, the the I don't have any statistics. I can't tell you how many Russians have watched it. Uh, I know that it was widely distributed, and if you just look at the numbers of views, you know it, it received huge eyeballs. Were those Ukrainian eyeballs? Definitely. Were there Russian eyeballs mixed in? Yes. And I think that's the kind of speech uh, that will con people will continue to share it. So uh, I, I I'm sorry I don't have any analytics, but it was very, very powerful. And, and I think the broader point is this is one of the reasons why Vladimir Putin finds Vladimir Zelensky so annoying is that Zelensky can communicate, you know, extremely well in Ukrainian, in Russian and haltingly in English, but he's a great communicator. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, uh, presumably in the end, the fact that Russians do still have reasonably untrammeled access to the internet will, will make a huge difference. It remains to be seen how much uh, Elon Musk's st different Starlink will make to that. Um, uh, I, can we come to Yasmin? Oh, Yasmin's no, no longer here. If anyone, she she was mentioning uh, fear and consternation on on the part of Russians in in London. I'd be really interested to know if if anyone has encountered. That I mean, I'm, heaven knows. I, I hope they don't feel censored here, but 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 you never know. Uh, before we run out of time, I want to come back to Roderick Line. Um, a, a lot has been said, Roderick, uh, uh, optimistically in, in in the rear view mirror now um, by diplomats about diplomats and the the goal before this war started in the in the days before it started of giving. Putin himself a face-saving off-ramp, a way to climb down. Well, that didn't work. Macron's still trying, but it, it hasn't worked yet. But I wonder if we take a step back and but hold that thought, is it is it horribly condescending or is there some truth in the idea that the Russian people need a face-saving off-ramp? That, that, that a time might come in the next few weeks when they realize the extent to which they've been lied to, and then they'll need uh, a face-saving way of acknowledging it, or do, or do you do you imagine that if if that moment comes, it'll all happen very quickly, and and um, as it has in, in in Soviet history, and there'll be a revolution on the streets. Well, I think Western leaders have got to make very clear that they are focusing on the people who have done this. That's above all Putin and the military leadership, and that this is not a war against the Russian people. Uh, but you can't offer a face saver to the people, and you certainly can't offer a face saver to Putin. He is now beyond reason and beyond the pale, and I just simply don't know why Macron keeps ringing him up. That just makes Macron look weak. I think the situation that we are now going to face is Putin is not going to stop until he's got control of Ukraine, which means the West out of Ukraine and Ukraine away from the West. And to the extent that he feels he has been impeded on his way to that objective, which he clearly has, he will blame the West and he will seek revenge because that's what he always does when he feels he's been defeated or humiliated. He won't have been defeated exactly. And he will double down. Now, we are now seeing nuclear blackmail. We may see more nuclear blackmail, implicit threats, threats against people like Poland or the Baltic states. I think we're very likely to see disruption in the Balkans, through Serbia and through Dodik in Bosnia, possibly elsewhere, such as Libya, uh, probably disruption on the gas market. Uh, internally, um, there are only two ways that you can get rid of Putin, uh, and it can't be done from the outside. One is by a mass uprising, and I don't think you know, there is any chance of that happening at the moment, because he is going to continue cracking down as he has done utterly ruthlessly. He will do whatever is necessary to save his skin. And the only other way is through an inside job. And he has surrounded himself with super loyalists who are going to protect his position because they have to protect themselves. When you talk about people like Bortnikov or, or Patrushev or Sho Sho Shoigu, um, they're in a situation with Putin where they either hang together or they will hang separately. And so uh, that is, what anybody who is trying to make a change of leadership is going to be up against. So I think it's going to be a slow burn. Uh, I'd love to be proved wrong. I think that as the 
costs of occupation come in, the costs of sanctions, the costs to Russians of isolation come in, then this is going to undermine Putin's position incrementally. I think it's possible that the 2024 presidential election, which we should put in quotation marks, could actually be a focus for discontent. Uh, there have been polls showing the majority of Russians would like a change of leader in 2024. In 2011, elections were a focus for discontent. Putin will not want to step down, but uh, this is a potential focal point. And my final point is, uh, I would recommend to anybody on this call that they dial up the site of the Russian International Affairs Council, REAC, and read the article put on it today by Mr. Andrei Kortunov. He cannot directly, this is put out by Ria Novosti, um, attack the invasion, but he has set out seven points, uh, which is his forecast of the medium to long-term uh, uh, consequences for Russia of what has happened. Uh, and um, carefully written, but it's a pretty good list. I haven't got space to read it out to you. That's really useful, practical pointer, and we will follow that up. Uh, Phoebe is going to try and uh, find a, a link for the chat. Before we run out of time, let me give uh, Melinda and Sam uh, a last word each. Uh, uh, Melinda first, um, uh, allow yourself a bit of crystal ball gazing. How, how does this... Styles. I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Melinda very sadly has to jump off this call. So um, she's Not already a left. Not a problem. Sam, it's all yours then. Um, uh, how, how does this unfold? What, what is your sort of single most plausible scenario and what role does the Russian opposition play in it? You know, I, I, I kind of feel like I'm done making predictions because I didn't think this war was going to happen for reasons we've been discussing, right? This, this is a right. war that, even though clearly it was possible with that many troops parked on the Ukrainian border, that um, does not make any sense right, for, for Putin himself and does not make any sense for, um, uh, for Russia, at least the way I understand sense, because I can't see a situation in which this ends well and brings a better position for him or for the country than the position they were in before it started um you know i think there's been some discussion in the chat as well about you know is there um is there an optimistic scenario um i mean i suppose one optimistic scenario is 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 that he he does find that again with the evangelical controlling television there's there's enough sort of wiggle room for him to declare some kind of a victory um without actually achieving the goal that we've all assumed which is that the, the, the uh, decapitation of, of the ukrainian state uh, and essentially regime change um uh, but it doesn't look from what we're seeing on the battlefield that that's actually what he has in mind, right? He does seem to be pushing very hard in that direction. Um, and um, the, the, the bad news is that that means things are going to get worse. I think that imagining that things are going to be better just because Kiev is eventually captured and the country eventually comes under control um, is, is a mistake. Um, keeping Ukraine is going to turn out to be at least as hard as winning it um, and is going to impose further costs on, uh, on uh, the Russian state, on the Russian economy, and on Russian society. Um, I, I agree with, um, uh, with Roderick that uh, uh, an elite coup is, is more likely than uh, a, um, uh, a street level uh, revolution, um, uh, although the two things can often go hand in hand. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I do think that there, it, there are very few people within the Russian elite, with the exception of a couple of the people, again, that Roderick mentioned, sort of in the security apparatus, who, who really have no future without, without Putin. Um, there are very few people um, who will be better off uh, at the end of this than, than they are now. Right? Um, and in fact, there are a, a great number of people for whom this will be very deeply uh, uh, disempowering. So the incentives are there right, for, um, for political change to be led from um, uh, from the top, whether they will be able to engineer it again, Putin has been planning for for that eventuality for a very long time. Um, is is another question, right? But you know, Lukashenko was 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 planning for that eventuality and only managed to stay on his feet uh, because uh, Russia propped him up. And um, Takayev in Kazakhstan was planning for that eventuality and only managed to stand on his feet because Russia propped him up. Belarus and Kazakhstan can't prop Putin up. So if, if, if push comes to shove, he will be very much on his own. Thank you so much. 
we're a little over time, so I, I won't go on. Uh, I'm just um, re reminded of, of two points, which is that those of us who came of age as it were when in the year of, of miraculous revolutions in 89, 90, I think probably have a tendency to assume that they can happen again. And, and uh, in, instead what has happened as Anne Applebaum has written about and others uh, is, is that uh, autocrats have found ways to seize power and stay in power and use technology to stay in power um, despite everything and with the deployment of immense cruelty. And so I, I feel I should offer an apology for even uh, suggesting that the Russian opposition was super. And I think none of us here can imagine what it's like. And those who have been out on the streets uh, have shown um, immense bravery as of course have those in, in Ukraine over the past few, few days. Um, but some really interesting concrete points. I'll just rattle through a few of them. Uh, Sam's point that actually the protests have been smaller than those uh, for Navalny so far. And the problem is finding people who think a change would actually help. Roderick Lyons' point that there is no mechanism now because Putin has been busily um, uh, recasting the Russian constitution for so long to change the leader. Um, uh, Melinda issued a, a call for a new Russian language TV station broadcasting into Russia. Perhaps that's something that people should be thinking about. Um, uh, and Roderick also made the really important point that perhaps we shouldn't be thinking of uh, Russian society uh, as a blob, that's my word, but more in, in segments, including um, elites who are frantically rethinking um, uh, what to do and what to think now, but also uh, large numbers of Russians who will be rallying around the flag. Finally, um, uh, you mentioned the possibility of disruption in the Balkans, and, and, and it's really important to remember uh, that perhaps there's uh, more risk of that in the Balkans than in the Baltics. And you mentioned Libya, which is subject for a whole other conversation. And I'm sure that that would involve mercenaries apart from anything else. Thank you again, Sir Roderick Lyne, Professor Sam Green, Melinda Herring, uh, and all of you for joining us. I should have said right at the top that this is the first of three consecutive thinkings on related subjects. Tomorrow we're going to, in our open news thinking, uh, be talking about the big story, of course, and possibly focusing on Europe, whose role in all this has been quite dramatic and quite unexpected, um, arguably and possibly weapons if people want to talk about that. And then on Thursday, we're gonna be talking about the role of Russian money in London and the role of London in Russian money um, in all this. Thank you again very much.